what you said at the end, I think uh, there's more to life than just having children, but that, that it, having children is so essential and fundamental. It is like the perpetuation of the life force, what connects you to everything. I mean, nationalism is really derived from our sense of family. Uh, and because obviously, like, that's what a nation is, is really a big family. And today in this kind of pornified generation, in this kind of individualistic atomized culture, people have learned to, un unfortunately, to separate sex from breeding. They don't look upon uh, someone as a... Uh, Oh, I want to. I want to make children with this person. That's what draws me to them. Instead, they look in a more reductive sense upon people. And I think this is what's happening with a lot of these uh, mixed race couples. Is that you know the the woman is just there to kind of serve these more mundane uh, pleasures and needs as opposed to fulfill the perpetuation of the bloodline. There is a lack of consciousness of this. And when you become conscious of it, it actually is quite sexy, in my opinion, to think about it in that way because uh, that's actually what that's actually what uh, sex is supposed to be about um, but these things have been alienated from one another in the minds of so many through our culture and and that is really I think at the core of the tragedy here in many ways um, but uh, also what you said about the attention revolution about how you know there's a kind of old adage you know women trade attention for sex men trade sex for attention um, Oh, sorry, I got that the wrong way around. Uh, men trade attention for sex. Women trade sex for attention. And yeah, this attention. is a kind let of me, vulgar. Let me tell you, before you go on, let me tell you, attention's not that important to men, really. It's not. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it isn't. But, I mean, it's important what we give our attention to, right? And, uh, you know, so for women, women to try and get some of our attention, which is what's important to them, uh, they, they trade sexual access. Now, that's a very vulgar way of approaching things. You should probably aspire to a higher deal. But in a certain sense... When you marry a woman, that's the ultimate sacrifice of attention because nothing requires more attention than a wife. So, you know, that's probably the ultimate exchange of, of sex and attention, I guess you could say, in, in a certain sense. But the point is, is that through social media, women have access now to so much attention that they just simply couldn't get before. Um, and, and this is, I think this is a large kind of component in the emergence of the fem cell. And the, the fem cell is emerging not because they have a lack of options, but they have a lack of good options. And there's a kind of hypergamous element as well to female sexuality, which means that their standards often far outpace uh, their value. And you see this a lot, particularly also exacerbated through the internet, because, you know, if you lived in a small community of, say, you know, a thousand people, there's only so many single people. And so, you know, couples kind of pair off in a kind of re relatively organic hierarchy. They have a, a, a kind of realistic perception of what's around them and they kind of see where they fit and pair off according to that. But with the internet, people are exposed to so many people uh, or the kind of simulation of people and the simulation and obviously sexier people are projected more into your face and people only upload photos of themselves that look better and so on. And so there's this warped perception uh, and this warped attention where you can get this, uh, you know, women can get attention from anyone online just by showing that they're a woman, basically. Um, and so this is kind of disrupting the whole uh, traditional so-called sexual marketplace. I don't like that term. And I think that's that's a large problem uh, contributing to the failure to bond with people. But there's also that I think it's really more at that deeper level, which is like people have lost the meaning of of sex. People don't shame people for being uh, sluts anymore. People don't shame people for miscegenating anymore. People don't. There's just a lack of social shaming for degenerate behavior. It's become normal with many groups of men to just talk about like you go, you talk to a guy, and then they just talk about what porn they like to jerk off to. Like it's a normal subject of conversation. It's fucking disgusting. Uh, like it's embarrassing that you even do that. Why the fuck are you telling me about it? Like, it's gay to even talk about it with me as well. So it's like, but this has just become normal to a lot of people these days. People have become so perverse and have, have lost their way so much. So really, it's, it's a very deep cultural problem, I think, that, that this is a, a component of. Also, I do notice with the guys that have Asian girlfriends, generally speaking, they look like nerds. Like, they look like they play World of Warcraft or 
I mean, I know you used to play World of Warcraft, but look at the stereotypical, like Blair is not the stereotypical World of Warcraft player, but they look like the stereotypical, the stereotypical, uh, um, yeah, Dungeons and Dragons player or something. The, the kind of Reddit user, uh, they kind of look like that, uh, you know, kind of soft and pudgy, uh, no jaw and so on. And so, you know, perhaps they don't really have any better options. Um, and, and so there's a little bit of that going on as well. It's like, uh, and they're breeding out as a result because, as you said before, Asian women are very easy. Asian women are very kind of sexually aggressive as well. When you said Asian women are more feminine, I would push back on that a little bit. Appear, I mean, I think I they, they I, said, I said they appear more feminine the way they dress yeah. and act. They appear, and they're not necessarily when you get to know them. I agree with that. Yeah, like, uh, cause I, I never dated an Asian woman, but I've worked jobs where there was Asian women there. And so, you know, I kind of saw them every day for a certain period of my life. And so I got a little bit of an insight into the psychology of Asian women as a result of that. And, um, you know, that's what I found is that actually they are quite masculine in how they approach things. They're kind of quite rational in their decision making. They're far less emotional in comparison to white women. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there's a, I think there's less sexual dimorphism. I think I remember Thultide posting actually a study on this before about how there's less sexual dimorphism between uh, Asians than there is between whites. Whites have the most sexual dimorphism, which is a, which basically means sexual difference so actually like from a biological standpoint white women are more feminine than any other race and white men are kind of more relatively masculine to their women than any other race um but yeah the uh when it comes to asian women i think they do present themselves maybe in a kind of superficially feminine way but they have that also that sexual aggression which men have where they actually go out and try and get what they want um, and a white man is kind of high status to Asian women for many reasons, particularly if they're an immigrant to a white country. You know, they feel like, well, if I have a mixed race child, they're going to fit in more to Australia than an Asian child or whatever. And, uh, you know, white men are kind of perceived as more uh, attractive in many cases than, than Asian, uh, Asian men and so on. So there's a lot of different aspects to this, probably because of the greater sexual dimorphism. But you know, I noticed this before where Asian women have been very sexually aggressive towards me and other people, other friends and so on. And they're very matter of fact. And if you are someone who you don't have a lot of balls to approach a particular woman that you like or to, uh, you're not good at flirting, you're not good at, uh, you know, you're not good at getting a girlfriend, a white girlfriend. Um, it's like you lower the difficulty setting with Asians. Uh, you don't have to be as charismatic. You don't have to they're not as emotionally volatile. They're a bit easier to manage. They're more matter of fact. Um, and a lot of these men probably are lower T. And so they appreciate uh, a woman who is a little bit more dominant in certain, in certain kind of mundane aspects of like, you know, uh, could, making plans about what you're going to do and controlling your uh, everyday life or whatever. So yeah, I think it's, it's quite disgusting to really think about, but I think these are a lot of the dynamics that are relevant here. I don't know exactly what the solution is because it's such a deep and complex social problem. But on a personal level, if you have any friends who are miscegenating, you should, I mean, if they don't have our worldview, just directly shaming them probably isn't going to work. Like if they're people that are sympathetic mm -hmm. to our politics, you could just directly shame them. But if they're kind of normies, um, you should probably try and just have a frank conversation with them about, uh, you know, the problems with having mixed race children, the identity crisis, the other kind of medical problems that are associated with it and so on, um, you know, try and bring some awareness in that area before it's too late uh, and they actually have children. Because once a white man has children with an Asian woman, now his bloodline is invested in the multicultural project. Now his bloodline is invested in the anti-white replacement of our race. Like now we, Now he becomes invested in um the anti-racist society that uh overlords are constructing whereas if you have white children then the 14 words become a biological imperative for you. you we have to secure a future for our children for our grandchildren and so on and it's just simply not negotiable once you have white children you're totally invested by like you know fundamentally in that future so um it's really, it's really important. I think people who take cavalier attitudes towards this kind of thing and, and write it off as unserious, 
you, you, you need to get your head checked if you're in this movement. This is miscegenation is in many ways the original one of, if not the worst possible things like that could be happening to us. Because even if you fill our country with a bunch of foreigners, if white people keep breeding with each other, our race will still survive and we'll still be in a position to do something so, yeah. to protect our people. But if we breed out, then it's over. So, right. Well, you can change immigration policy within the span of a, a year, three years, you can change economics to our policies. But once you lose your race, once your demographic change is permanent, generally. So that's why uh, that is an important thing, I suppose, to retain. But 